Hi, everyone, and welcome to The Week Ahead. I'm Tony Nash, and today we're joined by Mike Green, who is the Chief Strategist at Simplify Asset Management, and Tracy Schuchart from Hill Tower Resource Advisors, and Sam Rines from Corbu. So we're going to start off today getting a little bit nerdy. Uh, we're going to talk about productivity, inflation, and secular stagnation. Uh, there's a great piece that Mike wrote uh, a week ago, and I want to dive into that a little bit. Uh, next, we're going to jump into the Fed outlook uh, with Sam. He's been very consistent with his view on the Fed for the past probably nine months. And so I want to really see what's changed with the Fed outlook. And then we're going to look at uh, German NACAS issues with Tracy and kind of how that story is evolving. So, guys, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, I really appreciate the time you've taken to, to talk with us. Thank you. CA Futures is our subscription platform for global markets and economics. We forecast hundreds of assets across currencies, commodities, equity indices, and economics. We have new forecasts for currencies, commodities, and equity indices every Monday morning. Uh, we do new economics forecasts for 50 countries once a month. Within CA Futures, we show you our error rates. So every forecast, every month, we give you the one and three month error rates for our previous forecasts. Uh, we also show you the top correlations and allow you to download charts and data. Uh, CA Futures is available for $58 a month, $75 a month, or $99 a month. You can find out more or get a demo on completeintel.com. Thank you. So, um, so Mike, I want to talk about your, um, your newsletter, a really stellar newsletter on productivity and inflation. You called it procrastination. Um, for anybody who hasn't signed up for Mike's newsletter, I would definitely recommend it. Do you mind walking us through that kind of at a high level? And why is that important, particularly right now? Uh, so this is going to be an interesting part of the discussion. Is uh, I'm obviously interested in Sam's take on it as well. Um, and, and can you guys hear me clearly? I just realized I took off my headset. So yep. as long as you can hear me clearly, we're good. Yep. Um, the the dynamics of what is actually going on are we experiencing a slowdown in productivity growth or is our model of productivity broken right and therefore we're effectively trying to push on a string to get all sorts of things fixed that may actually be we may be damaging them in the process of fixing them is really kind of the core point that i was making and there's this question about how do we measure productivity growth how do we think about it traditional model, what's called the solo swan framework, is that productivity growth is a compounding feature, right? I'm able to produce 1,000 this year. Next year, I'm able to produce 10% more, so 1,100. The year after that, 10% more, you know, 11, uh, 12, whatever it is, 1221, et cetera, right? We can continue that process as we go through a exponential series that grows in a manner and suggests that we should be experiencing something along those dynamics. That model is increasing, and, and what we have seen against that is a slowing of the rate of growth that we measure as productivity or as total factor productivity. Effectively, the inputs that we're putting in are separated. Let's ignore the inputs. And we're looking at how much more effectively we're using those inputs in each period, right? Yep. It's generally thought of as the technology component. Um, the evidence is growing that our models for how to measure this and how to think about this are flawed. In other words, it's not a compounding feature in the sense of multiplicative. It's actually an additive feature. In other words, if executed properly, we can see our wealth or our income levels grow by a fixed amount each year, right? So if we start at 1,000, the next year we grow by 100. The year after that, we grow by another 100. The year after that, we grow by another 100, et cetera. And every once in a while, technological innovations emerge that combinatorially change that and can lead to a step function increase in that, right? So wealth can begin growing by a differential amount. Um, if you measure those data series, you know, one that is compounding exponentially, one that is compounding in what's called an additive fashion, at least initially, they're going to look very similar. Right, so a thousand plus a hundred plus a hundred plus a hundred looks an awful lot like a thousand times one point one point one times one point one times one point one for a certain number of periods. 
but they very rapidly begin to diverge. If the model that you're trying to pursue is this multiplicative one, right? And this is hyper nerdy, I understand all this. Then it means this you're going to try to force all sorts of things through. And more importantly, you're going to actually start budgeting around that dynamic, right? Well, we expect to be this much wealthier in the future, right? We're going to see this dynamic. Anyone who's gone through life as a, and, and we all have to do that, right? You've gotten your first job. Your very first job leads to raises that are very rapid as you demonstrate competence. And then, you know, you can kind of budget off of that. You can budget off of, okay, well, my income's going to grow at 10% a year. But you rapidly discover somewhere in your 30s that that starts to slow down, right? And you suddenly discover that things stagnate. Well, the whole point is, is that you're supposed to live within your means and slowly accumulate savings so that you end up okay. But if you budgeted off the constant increases in income, you're going to really struggle, right? That's effectively what we're experiencing as a nation. We budgeted off the idea of nearly unlimited and trend growth. And now it actually appears that that model was wrong. And so the answer is, do we try to bang our heads and do more of the same? Or do we actually start to embrace that maybe a different model is operating this? And what are the implications for that? The most important one is if we try to believe in, an, in a multiplicative model, and the reality is an additive model, then things like inequality really begin to matter. Because if you have the upper income classes or the, the elites of society taking a higher share, eventually it means that the absolute numbers that are available for everybody else begin to fall. I think there's a tremendous amount of evidence that's what we're seeing. We're seeing genuine dissatisfaction rising amongst the lower income communities, or more accurately, if I really want to address it, it's the center of the distribution that's really being hammered into this framework. We're more than happy to basically buy off the very low end. We're more than happy to encourage the very high end and say, boy, you guys are really a gift to society. It's those in the middle that are increasingly getting hammered by this situation and by this philosophy. Okay, so let, let me ask you a quick question on that. When you say a constant rate of growth, a relatively constant rate of growth, you're talking about a real rate of growth, not a nominal rate of growth. Is that is that right? Both. So I just want to be very clear. We're actually not talking about a rate. We're actually talking about a quantity. Quantity. Right? So, okay. so instead of our income growing by 5% a year, you should think about our income growing by $500 or $1,000 a year. And that's going to continue. Now, naturally, that leads to slower rates of individual growth exactly as I described for an individual, right? I start off my career, I get a 10% raise off my $35,000 first starting salary. Wow, that's fantastic. I make $3,500 more. By the time I'm 50, right, I'm making 150,000. I don't get a 10% raise, but I get a $5,000 raise, right? Should I be unhappy with that 5,000 versus the 3,500? No, the 5,000 by definition is more but it's still its slower rate of growth. Okay, so uh, let me kind of try to take this a little bit more, I don't know, I guess theoretical. When we have Wait, inflation- you're gonna go more theoretical than me? Let, oh, yeah, perfect. let there me try a, a hypothetical situation. If we have an inflation rate at 7%, okay? And that's goods, that's services and so on. And then we have a super core inflation rate that that uh, takes out energy and food and a lot of other things, okay? That super core is really telling us the price of services wages. I mean, if we really boil it down, is that right, Sam? I mean, what is super core telling us? Super core is sticky, right? And it's sticky because wages tend to be sticky right, right. You, don't give, you don't give a to the to the point michael made you tend not to give somebody a 350 dollar raise and then take that raise away you right you you leave them at that and then you slowly take them up okay. higher or you fire them right there's there's kind of two options you either keep giving them pay raises or you get rid of them okay the, the, the problem with trying to to cut pay right except under extraordinary circumstances is it's a signal to the employee that they're less valuable Right. right. And like nobody wants to hear that and then show up at work the next day. Right. So if we're not seeing uh, productivity raise, say, multiplicatively or on a percentage basis, then when we see uh, excess inflation like we do today, um, 
it's really, there really isn't a way for people in the middle, as you say, the top end keeps what they have, the bottom end is subsidized, but there really isn't a way for people in the middle to keep up. Is that is that what you're saying? Since that super core is constant. Correct. So, so, so this is actually really kind of the key component that I would highlight, and it's why inflation feels so bad to those in the center, right? Again, at the low end, we subsidize it, we inflation adjust, and we say it's going to rise at a rate, right? The inflation rate is 5%. We're going to adjust Social Security by 5%. We're going to adjust SNAP by 5%. That person in the middle, though, can only if they're subject to these rules, which, as I said, increasingly appear to be true, their increment of productivity is not a percentage, right? Just imagine yourself on a, an assembly line. It is implausible that you are going to become 5% more productive every single year of your entire career, right? Like, that's just a simple reality, right? And, you know, I produce 10,000 tubes of toothpaste as a single worker, Today, as I get, as I go through my career, I get more productive, but I don't get 5% more productive every single year. Otherwise, I'd be producing basically all the toothpaste in the world as a single worker by the end of my career, right? It's not entirely true, but you understand the illustration, yeah. right? What is entirely plausible is, is that I'm able to produce 100 more tubes of toothpaste each year because I figure out new ways of doing it, right? And that's a decreasing rate of growth perfectly matched by the data series we have in terms of things like productivity over time in a career, right? My initial steps into my career, I have my productivity rises very rapidly. Later in my career, my productivity growth slows down, even though my absolute productivity is higher, right? When you have a rate like inflation, that's hammering that because it is a rate that is being reduced. It means that I'm experiencing a real loss of income and purchasing power. My productivity is less valuable under that framework. My living standards fall, right? Mm -hmm. It matches perfectly. If, if we had a rate-based dynamic, we really wouldn't care, right? Theoretically, we could just say, well, you know, inflation is, is a truly pass-through experience, but it's not. <laughs> Okay, great. So let's take this a little bit to kind of productivity. I I um I saw this chart this week from uh, Natixis, which is a European research firm. They're a great team, smart economists. And so uh, I've got it up on the screen. It's in your packet, Mike. Um, yep. uh, looking at per capita productivity, which is economic output divided by hours worked is a basic rough formula for productivity, right? So we see a bump in productivity than a sharp fall, okay? Is this a real productivity rise or fall? Is it more of a boost of government spending and blurry visibility on hours work during the pandemic? Like, what, is, what does this mean and how does this fit within the kind of constant rates discussion uh, that you're observing? Well, so, so I would actually highlight that this is almost a perfect illustration of that type of phenomenon. It's something that we've seen since the 1990s, which is the reality is that adding additional workers to the process doesn't simply increase the output by the number of workers, right? It, the, the, the production process is inherently limited in finance terms. Effectively, the beta of an additional worker is always going to be less than one. Right. So when I add new workers, I'm going to end up lowering my productivity. When I add hours to the day, I'm going to end up lowering productivity. When I remove them, I'm going to raise productivity if the system is not, you know, operate under this phenomenon in which each incremental worker or each incremental hour has the same contribution. Right. It's a great description of what's going on. And by and large, what we've seen in 22 is no tangible increase in output relative to an increase in the inputs, which is what you're showing on the Natixis dynamic. Right. Part of that, by the way, I do think is actually measurement, right? How do we properly measure how many hours somebody working from home is working, right? 
am I spending my time working? Am I spending my time running the vacuum cleaner? Am I spending my time experimenting with keto recipes, right? You all yeah. know the answer for me on that last one. So that has been a consistent pattern. Um, I'm not entirely sure I completely agree with the way that Natixis frames it, although yeah. I do think that that is the direction that we're headed in. The Fed is on this path that I think is is fundamentally flawed, where they're effectively saying, okay, let's really raise the costs of increasing production. Let's really raise the costs of holding incremental inventory. Let's make it increasingly difficult for companies to finance themselves. And off the back of that, we should expect to see a dramatic increase in production and a fall in inflation. I, it makes zero sense to me, but you know, um, they're, they're doing what they're doing. So they're, they're effectively trying to force productivity improvement, at least in theory, um, by making the cost of that worker higher? What they're attempting to do, is, that's a way of thinking about it, right? They're trying to force a reorganization of society so that it is at its core more productive. That would be great if human beings were widgets. But one of the most you know, interesting things about what's going on right now is, is that this recession looks radically different than prior recessions that we've had traditional recessions target the cyclical worker, the person mm -hmm. on the assembly line, et cetera. We're still recovering from the depths of the COVID crisis mm -hmm. on the production front. We're producing less than 15 million vehicles, you know, on the automotive side, we still have shortages of houses. We still have homes that are currently under construction from the last boom, et cetera. We haven't seen the impact of those falling off yet. This cycle is very different. We're firing people that have college degrees for the first time almost in history without a meaningful slowdown in the rest of the economy. We all experience this. There's shortages of housekeepers and low-end workers, people that are willing to change bedpans in an environment of COVID in a nursing home. You can't find those people, right? But you can find plenty of college-educated French medieval literature majors, right? Now, what good are French medieval literature majors? I'm not entirely sure, but we stole those signals from the market a long time ago through our system of student loans. And now, of course, we're dealing with the ramifications of it in the Silicon Valley environment where Google basically was trying desperately to hire anybody to conceal their innate levels of profitability and avoid things like antitrust actions. They brought in all sorts of workers who are very marginal contributors, primarily contributing on you know, various TikTok memes in terms of how their pictures are taken. <laughs> but the workers being laid off at Google make $275,000 a year on average. All right, just stop and think about that. That's a lot of money. That's a great job, right? Yeah. You know what the unemployment benefit is in California, the maximum unemployment benefit. I'm guessing Sam knows this off the top of his head, but. Is it like 1500 a month or something? Nope, it's $13,000 total. Okay. So somebody who gets fired from a $275,000 a year job is supposed to immediately go and file unemployment claims so that they can generate a $13,000 benefit over 26 weeks. When, by the way, if they just wait a year, they could actually file in arrears and get it as a lump sum payment that would help to pay for a flight to Hawaii, right? A vacation in Hawaii. They, they don't know how to do this. They don't know how to tap into the market. They have no idea how those systems work in contrast to the traditional cyclical employees who, when they lose their jobs, have the number taped to their refrigerator. So I, I had dinner with a technology recruiter last night. He told me that for tech jobs in New York, for every tech job that he sees, there are 3,000 resumes for every tech job. He said, it's terrible in New York. I can't imagine, you know, Silicon Valley is much different, but he said there's so much slack in the tech workforce in New York that they get 3,000 applications for every job that's posted. He said, honestly, I can't go through all of them. I go through about 800 of them. And I can't, I can't look at it anymore. Your, your brain, your brain fries on that, right? But now the flip side of that is, of course, what we're supposedly receiving from the Fed surveys of job openings and labor turnover, the JOLT surveys. It suggests, wait a second, there's two jobs available for every unemployed worker. Where do, how do we possibly get to the 3,000 applicants for every job if there's two jobs for every unemployed worker? It's just the data is a mess. It's a mess. Yeah. Exactly. BA, is, BA is not going to get that accurately. They're working on uh, a methodology that's probably two decades old. I haven't looked into it for a long time, but 
you guys would know more about that than I would, but I, you know, I assume that their methodology is, is they took a, they took a terrible methodology and they made it much worse with the introduction of the birth death adjustments in 2012. So now they basically just assume that jobs are being created. Ooh. Oh, that's good. Okay. Yeah, no, it's great. It's, it's <laughs> that's good. we have a, we have an economy based on assumptions. Okay. Oh. That's good. Yeah, Sam, it's, 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 why, it's why you just jump to the indeed data and call it a day. I mean, that's what I do. You, you do what? I'm sorry. I just look at the indeed.com data. Yeah. I mean, that's the only one I use. I mean, one. And, and, and even the even the indeed data, though, you have to recognize it's, it's the little, dynamics of share yes, gain, right? So you yeah. have to make some adjustment for the fact that increasingly people are finding their jobs on indeed.com, right? Exactly. So, yeah, you do. But it's at least a little bit better because it's at least yeah. real jobs being posted. So, and, so and, 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 and the response rates, by the way, to the Jolts data is like, it's just so bad at this point. It's fallen yeah, yeah. from Sam, Sam, again, Sam probably knows the data better than I do, but I believe the response rates for the Jolt say, excuse me, going into the global financial crisis, we're north of 65%. Today, it's below 30. Yeah, it's it's gone down about 50%, give or take. Yeah. On the so the response rate to the Jolt data, you mean the companies who are responding to the surveys for Jolt data, right? The companies that are responding to the surveys for Jolt's data has fallen by around 50%. Among other things, that's because the BLS continues to rely, and this is true for the household survey as well, right? They continue to rely on things like landline surveys. You will not get a call from the BLS on your cell phone. This is a legacy from the dynamics of cell phone calls used to cost the receiver, right? So you used to have to pay if somebody called you. Therefore, they would never call a cell phone because people would be like, hey, this is a survey, they hang up. Now we don't have anybody with landlines anymore. So right? Sam, does so, your company have a physical landline? I have never had a landline in my life. Tracy, does your company have a physical landline? That would be no. Mike, does your company have a physical landline? We do not. Neither does mine. So I know we're probably outliers, but still, you know, we're in small, mid-sized companies and none of our companies have a landline. So BLS, BA would never um survey us they, so. would, they would never survey us and the methodology is that we are presumed to have the same behavior as those who answer their phones yeah okay it's just, it's just a mess i mean that is a technical term for what happens when you go through transitions and you have far too much dependence on accuracy of data yep right we, we're, we've just we've tried to fine tune the system to the point that it's not meaningful anymore Yep. We're using that system to establish monetary policy of unprecedented levels of intervention. Okay. So Mike, let's go to the conclusions of your newsletter. What, like kind of how do we, what does this mean for inflation? What does this mean for how, how you view our ability to fight it? Well, you know, again, um, I was saying this, you know, I say this over and over and over again, right? We're a narrative based species. Right, we have to explain everything. One of the narratives that we have deeply accepted is the idea that anything the government does is bad, right? And so, you know, we basically have gotten to the point where, where our conclusion is Elon Musk is a more talented individual than Mike Green, therefore, he should pay less taxes or certainly shouldn't have to pay taxes on surplus through a higher progressive rate, et cetera. We want to keep the money with those who have demonstrated productivity, right? It's not working is the easiest way to put it, right? What we actually know is that any one individual has a combination of luck and skill in their individual career. How that gets compensated, how that gets rewarded is completely context dependent. If the world was back in the 19th century and we were you know, reliant upon various forms or 18th century and we were reliant on various forms of physical strength, Tracy's role in the economy would be radically different today than it that radically different then than it is today, right? Mine as well, right? Instead of being a giant forehead on, on a TV screen, I'd probably be slaving away in a coal mine somewhere. Our ability to raise individuals to, to that capability and to allow them to participate in the system is really what's at question. And we're just doing a terrible job of incorporating people into that system. We're increasingly saying the only people that matter are the Elon Musk's, Peter Thiel's, you know, Sergey Brin's of the world, and we should want them to continue to bestow their, their capabilities upon us. 
again, that's part of the reason for highlighting the productivity dynamics. It's just not, there's no evidence that that's actually true. And so what we're doing is, is we're taking away from people who could be contributing to society at a lower level, but their aggregate contribution is like a bunch of ants, right? I mean, each individual ant can bring something to the table, even if they don't get to be the queen, right? We're disregarding them saying that they don't matter, reducing their role and their compensation in society, encouraging them not to participate. And I think that sits at the core of the challenges that we face right now. Hmm. That's a tough, that's a tough one, especially given where our infrastructure is today. Sam, what thoughts do you have on that? Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty much right there with him. I mean, I do think that there's a significant amount of problems and it's very problematic when the, we'll call it the lower quartile of the income spectrum, you know, and the middle in particular, uh, begins to see a real wage uh, go negative and go negative in a meaningful way. And they generally don't see a way out of it. Uh, what's also interesting is that, you know, we were relying on CPI numbers and, you know, we talk about super core, we talk about core services, X shelter, et cetera, et cetera. But when the middle is actually looking at what their wages are going to, it's predominantly the things we cut out, right? It's shelter, oil, and food. I mean, that's a significant portion of their income. So while it's always entertaining and it's always kind of a good thing to look at the underlying metrics on inflation, it is not the real world experience. Right? Yep. The easiest the easiest way for me to feel good or bad in the morning, well, not, not necessarily me because I'm in Texas. So the bigger the number on the gasoline board, the better off I am. Uh, but uh, you know, for the vast majority of Americans, that's not true. So it, it's, to me, there's, there's a significant longer term issue here when the consumption metrics are highly reliant on call it the bottom 50% and the bottom 50% is getting eaten away. Yep. Sounds pretty dire. I hope it's not really that <laughs> dire. And Mike, San Francisco Fed, I think you should go. Sam, Dallas Fed, I think you should be there and you guys should solve these problems. So I, I, I will tell you, I spent a significant amount of time last two weeks ago at the New York Fed. And the answer is really quite straightforward, right? It is a orthodox institution that is extremely captured by the idea that the cost of money is ultimately the determinant of inflation. Um, and they're not prepared to consider anything else, right? So the solution is the beating shall continue until morale improves. Great. <laughs> and, and I guess the real question to be a realist is how do you game that? Right. I mean, that's the question for all of us. And that's why we we talk about this every week is how do you take that view and how do you game that to make the best of your income? Um, so the 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 quick answer is, is that you do the best you possibly can to engage in the equivalent of doomer prep. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it's not to stockpile canned food and pasta. Um, it's to basically remove yourself from a situation in which you are dependent upon the impact of the Federal Reserve, right? So the Fed yep. is pursuing a model that is going to raise inflationary pressures, that is going to lower economic activity. We're all caught in the crossfire of that. That means that our incomes are going to be negatively affected in real terms. Our capacity to service debt is going to fall in the future and therefore you want to reduce as much debt as you, you you basically do the exact opposite of what we've been encouraged to do for the past 40 years 40 years you do everything in your power to reduce debt reduce dependence on the system and create put yourself into a situation in which you're effectively benefiting from the higher interest rates meaning you're holding cash mm. yeah very good okay um thanks mike that is kind of but there's a lot to think about there. And again, anybody who doesn't get Mike's newsletter, I would encourage them to uh, look for his sub stack and, uh, and subscribe to his newsletter. So uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, Sam, let's let's look at the Fed outlook, given the kind of doomer Fed uh, closeout that Mike just gave us. Let's look at the, the Fed outlook and, and, uh, and look at what's changed. So back in July of 2022, 
Um, you presented in your newsletter, you said peak inflation and peak hawkishness dominate the narrative following the FOMC meeting. This was the 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 Fed meeting in, uh, I think it was late June, early July. Um, but it's you said that the FOMC has tunnel vision on inflation and the end of the tunnel is not visible. So this was, you know, almost a year ago, nine months ago. This past week, you said very similar. You said, until price over volume and the consumer breaks, it is still 25s for life. So, so you know, you've presented a very hawkish outlook um, for the Fed over that period. Well, not very, relatively, I'll say hawkish. So as far as I know, I don't know, you're the only person who's got it consistently right. Um, and you've been pretty flawless. So the Fed isn't letting up on inflation, and they've been working a pretty delicate trajectory, right? I mean, they they really went hard on 75s, and then they pulled back to 25s. What are you looking at now? And what has changed since Q2 of 22, since you spotted this last year? Yeah, so not much has changed. We can start there. Okay, um, good. Not much has changed uh, relative to what we were thinking that, right? We were, we were well above where the street was at that point for the terminal rate, and we continue to see 25s uh, and those 25s continuing uh, for the foreseeable future, right? And I do think that it's highly dependent on two things. It's highly dependent on where the where inflation actually comes in, and it's highly dependent on uh, where wages and the consumer end up. And when you look at the data, and to Michael's point, looking at the data that's being printed off, we call it the inflation report, the employment report, et cetera, et cetera. The, you know, there's a lot of noise in those systems. So instead of doing that, I, I basically just go through earnings reports constantly uh, as they're released and take it as, you know, these these management teams tend to have a pretty good idea of where they're going to set price, where they're going to set wages and what their input costs are going to be. When you look at companies from Pepsi to Coca-Cola, Nestle, Hershey, all of their pricing is going up there and they're going up significantly. What's the magnitude on average? Eight, 10%, 12%? On, on average, it's low teens in terms of year over year pricing. Uh, Pepsi said they were mostly done pushing price, but that means that they're still pushing price. Uh, today, Texas Roadhouse, of all places, said they were increasing their menu pricing 2.2% in March. Uh, they saw their commodity prices increasing for the year 5 to 6%, and their wages going up 5 to 6%. So that's number, you know, that's kind of one little, I call it a cog in the system. It's interesting you, know, you mentioned Texas Roadhouse. So we had retail sales, restaurants went up 25% year on year, right? How does that stop? I, I just don't understand. How, how does that rate of, of growth stop? What does it look like from your perspective? In, in terms of the year over year numbers? I mean, the year over year numbers were somewhat uh, skewed because of Om Omicron last year, right? So you had, okay. some, you had, you had some oddities in the data um, going in. Uh, to the retail sales report on a year over year basis, but on a month over month basis, they were very, very strong. And one of the things that, you know, to another one of the great points that Michael made a, a moment ago, it's, it's really interesting when you look at the dynamics of income to start 2023, social security payments increased by 8.7%. That's 70 million people that just got an, a nearly 9% raise in January, right? So that money is hitting the system. That's somewhere around 100, you know, call it $120 billion. And the marginal propensity to consume on that is extraordinarily high, right? The average dollar coming in the door on social security is going to the bottom half of the income spectrum and mostly skewed towards the lower half of that half that tends to get spent and it tends to get spent very, very quickly. So that's a high powered money mobiles. directly into the system. Well, it's, it's, it's a lot of eating out of restaurants, right? It's a lot yeah. of Cracker Barrel. It, you know, yeah. you look at Cracker Barrel's earnings, you know, their wages, et cetera. Walmart raising their wage. A lot of middle America, particularly at the bottom, is beginning to see some pretty significant pay raises. And those pay raises go straight into the economy. They don't go into savings. 
They don't go into 401ks. They don't go into the stock market. They go straight into spending and they tend to spend on, well, gasoline, groceries, eating, eating food out and to a certain degree shelter. Right. So right. these, these numbers are more than likely not one-off type deals, right? We're more than likely going to continue to see significant surprises to the upside. I mean, there's, there were some, I, I think it was Texas Roadhouse as well that said that their January was up in the mid twenties on a year over year basis. Right. Wow. So th- this, this type of dynamic, and I think it's, it's really interesting following on from Mike's portion it's a really interesting dynamic because if you don't have inflation crack, the Fed is going to continue with these 25s for the foreseeable future. And right now we're sitting at a terminal rate that's 5.25 to 5.5. And you know, they're going to continue pushing those, those further if you continue to have these, these data points. And it's really hard to see when the data points are going to crack. I mean, it's you know, you can kind of moving away from the restaurant and retail for a moment. John Deere is mid-teens on pricing for the year. I mean, those prices aren't going down. So that's farmers are going to see their equipment become more expensive. You know, you're going to have food becoming more expensive when you eat out. You have food at grocery stores becoming more expensive. I mean, at, you know, you know, to you know, Michael's point, it's probably not going to solve the problem by increasing interest rates, you know, immediately. And you haven't seen a crack in construction because of the massive backlog, because we didn't have lumber and we didn't have piping and we didn't have, you know, concrete, et cetera. You have, still have construction jobs. You still have oil field jobs. You still have all of the stuff in the middle of America. And you've had a few thousand people get laid off in tech, right? Yep. And they all got six to 12 month giant packages to, you know, go find another job. So those, they're not going to hit the jobless claims for at least six to 12 months from when they got laid off. They're all sitting pretty. They're all going on vacations. They're all spending money. So again, it's it's one of those where the economy still hasn't cracked and the Fed's going further. Yeah. I just want to be clear, like, and I know we've talked about this before, but I want to make sure that my understanding is still correct. The Fed is not trying to get pricing levels back to 2019. No. We're just trying to get them to stop rising. Correct? Yes. They yeah. Oh well, they would prefer to have disinflation, right? They want to have, you know, they want to get back to a two percent run rate, but no, they're not trying to get back, they're not trying to go deflationary. Okay. Trying. Can I can I, can I just toss something in to Please. add to Sam's point? Um, picture of North American tractor sales, right? Okay. And the really critical point is is that we're talking about price increases, dramatic price increases in tractor sales even as tractor sales themselves are give or take 40% below the levels from 2008, right? This is insane. This is clearly market power that is going through. The tractor industry is basically divided into two players, Deere and Agco. Neither one of which, you know, both of which have signaled we're no longer going to compete on price. We're going to basically try to load everything up and produce at a minimum level, right? These are monopoly and oligolist, oligol- oligol- <laughs> You know what I mean? Oligopolistic. Oligopoly, oligop- oligopolistic. I'm sorry. Um, it's all right. Makes it makes it hard. Um, pricing patterns where you produce well below the marginal demand because you're effectively trying to maximize your margins, right? So we're seeing yep. this over and over and over again. That's why we have the FTC. That's what we should be going after in terms of the behavior of individual companies. We should be penalizing them. We should be working to introduce new competition into these spaces, et cetera. And we just refuse to do it, right? We're terrified that in the process of harming these individual national champions like deer, that somehow we're going to create conditions under which we all, you know, collapse into uh, the proverbial flames of hell, right? The second component is that Sam hit on this dynamic of somebody who has social security just experienced a 9% raise. They actually experienced far more than that, because remember that those who are re- collecting social security tend to be amongst a class of individuals who have accumulated a degree of savings that they had anticipated living off of for the rest of their lives. Suddenly their checking accounts or bank accounts have gone from yielding or their money market funds have gone from yielding zero to yielding four and a half to 5%, right? If I have a hundred thousand dollars, that's $5,000 of, of incremental savings that I'm receiving. If I have a million dollars, that's $50,000 that I'm receiving. And by the way, my propensity to spend that is dramatically higher because it's income, not principal now. 
I actually am much more comfortable spending that than I would have been spending $50,000 before. Right. So everything that we're doing in like the last desperate act of the boomers to totally screw us all is basically yep. handing money to old people at the expense of young people who are going to lose their jobs. That's right. That's right. I think that is I think that's worth repeating. And, you know, we've we've talked about that in a, in a couple of other shows, not that directly, but say that again. So the government is handing out money to old people at the expense of younger, more productive workers who are losing their jobs. Correct. Right? It's just that straightforward. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. So <laughs> Sam, there's a lot to digest here, guys. It's not pretty. It's not a pretty episode. So Sam, tell us about, you know, what does the Fed look like over the next three, four months? So, you know, it's 25 as far as you can see. Yeah, but it's that simple. It's that simple, and I mean, it's that simple. It really, you only have a couple more prints of data before of data that matters before the Fed uh, meets and redoes its dot plot. I mean, okay. it, that's it's it's twenty fives for the next for uh, for the next three meetings. Okay. Then um, then there's the possibility of a pause, but I I would. I would be short the possibility of a pause there simply because to, you know, to reiterate what Mike said again, uh, it's a pretty orthodox place, right? They're going to continue raising yeah. rates until inflation breaks because that's what they believe will occur. So it's, but I think June by June will have had the base effect of crude being at 130 bucks a barrel, right? So it may core services X shelter doesn't have oil in it. They don't care. Okay. They don't. They, they, I, don't, they, really about, don't. They, they don't care about that. But that actually is a really critical point. And forget the year over year comparisons because nobody actually yeah. does that, right? Nobody sits down and does their yeah. budget and says, you know, gosh, oil was, you know, $130 this time last year. Now it's only right. $80. Therefore, I have more money to spend. They experience it immediately when they go to the gas tank and they go to fill up their gas, their gas tank. A year ago, they were filling it up for 100 bucks. Now they're filling it up for 60 bucks. Right. That's money that has gone back into the economy from the period of June and contributed to the perception of rebound that in turn is now theoretically feeding the inflationary concerns. Yep. Right. We see this in consumer sentiment surveys that are heavily dependent upon gasoline prices like the Michigan survey, et cetera. The minute gasoline prices bottomed or, or peaked, they began to experience improvements in sentiment even as the underlying conditions have deteriorated. Okay, Tracy, I want to bring you in here because I always get complaints when you speak last. So <laughs> tell me your thoughts on that in terms of oil consumption. Uh, as far as oil consumption in the United States? And the impact on inflation, you know, how, how do people experience that? And what impact do you think that has on how the Fed acts? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it, I completely agree with Mike. What it comes down to is what are the prices at the pump for the actual consumer, right? And that gives you extra, theoretically, or what's envisioned is extra spending, right? Extra spending money because you're not paying $100 anymore. As he said, for that example, you're paying $60. So now you have more um, excess cash to, I don't know, go out to dinner or, you know, to do it but that's kind of a that's a like a theoretical situation and the thing is is that i think that you know when we are talking about gas prices and when we are talking we really need to see longer term results for this not you know i think it's it, it's uh premature to say we're seeing excess spending in this area because gas prices are down this month because they fluctuate so much because you know gas has been you know that it's been very volatile since 2020. And so I think that there needs to be a lot more long-term data that is focused on this, which we're probably not gonna get from the government, but um, I think that would be, be beneficial into seeing you know, how exactly does this over the long-term reflect consumer spending habits. Great, okay, that's, that's hugely useful. Uh, Sam, back to you just to wrap this up. And uh, you've had this concept of um, uh, uh, hawk, grackle, dove, right? And for those who don't understand a hawk is obviously hawkish fed, 
a gracklish fed and sam correct me if i'm wrong is one that kind of is talking out of both sides of its mouth just making a lot of noise where they're not entirely sure which direction they're going to go and then you have a dovish fed which is obviously dovish right and so at when will you what data are you looking for or what behavior are you looking for for the fed to to really swing kind of gracklish oh so i do i do think the fed is gracklish at the moment Okay. Right. The Fed one grackle when it went to 25s because that gives them wiggle room on both sides. It gives them the ability to both push the terminal rate higher, push the terminal rate lower, much more data dependent in terms of every, you know, you take, you put in another 25, if you put up 400,000 jobs, if inflation comes in hot, you put up another 25 basis point hike. If it comes in low, you take it out, right? That's, that's really what the grackle is, right? It's when they talk a lot and don't really give you any incremental information, right? Last year, they were just pure hawk. It was every single time they open their mouth, they seem to just be hawk. Now it's, well, maybe we wanted to go 50, but we went 25, but maybe we don't have to go any further, but maybe- Which we is do. what we've seen over the know. last week. Yeah, so right? they're, they're, they're grackles, right? And okay. to reiterate this, and I'm, I think I said it um, here, I might not have- um, the grackle is the most annoying bird in the world. They are loud, they fly in groups, and they scream all the time. And it's a, uh, it, at least in Texas, you can't park your car under a tree for a long time. It's just the worst thing ever. Um, and, you know, doves are pretty, you know, it's pretty easy to you know, call it, call, you know, understand a dovish fed. It's pretty easy to understand a hawkish fed. It's very difficult to understand a grackleish fed. And that's where I think we're at right now. Okay, great. So just more to come there. We're waiting and seeing. We're, we're going to see at least three more 25s and then more to come. Yeah. That's, that's the story. Okay. Thank you, guys. That's That's great. Um, let's move on to uh, to Tracy, who everyone's been waiting for, of course. And so, um, Tracy, I, I'm responding to, uh, we, we sent out a, a, um, a tweet asking for questions. And one of our regular view, viewers, Daniel Cook, said, you know, how is industry in Germany coping with the NACAS situation today? So, you know, I want to bring in some of those questions pretty regularly. And, you know, you sent me a couple charts. Uh, the first one is on TTF NACAS. So can you talk us through that and what's happening in markets with TTF Net Gas? All right. So I, I feel like this is a total switch from what we've been talking about. Absolutely it is. We're switching to Europe right now, right? Yeah. I hate to add to the non-pretty situation, but we're going to, this episode is going to continue with a non-pretty situation. That's okay. You know, I think um, that there has been irreparable damage to industry and in not only Germany, but in the Euro area as a whole. And so I, I, I sent you that TTF chart because I wanted to point out that in fall of 2021 is when we had that very first spike, right? And that's when we really started seeing um, industry having to pull back. That is in particular in smelters, glass glass companies and chemical companies. And so I just want to run through very quickly kind of a timeline of the biggies that that happened. And, and this will make more, more sense later why I want to do this. But so in October of 2021, Nystar, which is one of the largest zinc uh, companies in the world, they cut zinc smelting production by 50% in uh, three top European smelters. December of 2021 started the aluminum smelting horrible problem, which um, Dunker K Industries in France, my French is terrible, so I know a million people will say that's not how you pronounce it. But anyway, um, which is the largest uh, aluminum smelter in France, uh, curbed output. Then you had followed by Romanian aluminum producer Alto Slatina. They started a program of total closure due to high energy prices. By May of 2022, aluminum production slides more. July of 2022, 
almost all of European smelting production is offline. September 2022, that starts the glass industry. So you have a French glassmaker, Duralix, uh, stops production entirely. Sorry, and let me stop you. So with the aluminum smelting, so if it's not being done in Europe, where is it being done? Tell me. Well, I, I was getting to that. Well, since you asked, ironically, it's Russia. Of course it is. <laughs> because <laughs> ironically, it's Russia. And um, what happened is that the EU actually sanctioned Russia aluminum imports in April of 2022. But there was a clause in that a particular sanction agreement that said you can get an exemption of products from Russian origin to be imported if you can get a special permit. Of course, uh, Europeans always circumvent their own sanctions. Always, right. always, always. So long and short of that is uh, it, within six months, EU imports of Russian alumin, aluminum <laughs> uh, surged over 70%. So that, that happened. Um, <laughs> Back to my timeline. So BASF, after cutting production throughout the entire year, in October of 22, they announced permanently they were downsizing their factory in uh, Germany as far as production and labor is concerned. And then in November 2022, they announced their largest service treatment, <laughs> uh, treatment site in China. Um, so long and short of this is that when you look at these industries, right, you have to look at like, especially uh, smelting and glass in particular, these glass furnaces, you just can't turn them back on, right? They take months and months to get them the proper temperature to, again. And if you look at, you know, if you revisit that um, TTF graph, you can see there's been no relief for these uh, industries to be able to get back online. So you can assume that's gone because now it's been over a year, right? And so people have already, so I mean, even, even Europe has already sourced other people outside of Europe. So these industries are, are not coming back. So can right? you talk us through capacity utilization and how the industry is not coming back has impacted capacity utilization? Because the capacity utilization is a measure of the capacity that is still there, right? Not the capacity that's online. Right. It's what is still there. And so what we see in the graph that I sent you is Germany. But really, if you look at the euro area as a whole, that graph looks exactly the same. And what we're seeing is that even though nat gas prices have plummeted, plummet, plummet, I can't speak today either, <laughs> plummeted over the last six months, we're still seeing utilization down. These industries are not coming back, in other words. So right? where are they going? They're they're being outsourced everywhere else. In fact, you know, um, we're seeing you know, Europe has a big problem with regulations and red tape, which has been a huge pitfall for companies. And so, oh, you know, it, it, companies have been looking elsewhere. For example, China, the U.S., Mexico, South America, and realize they've been dealing with this since the first spike in fall of twenty twenty one, and so. They've had plenty of time. And now I know the EU has been very vocal about the US Inflation Reduction Act and it's worried that that's gonna incentivize business to leave the EU for the US, which is a concern. I understand that, but you know, I guess I would say the essence of the debate has been this. In face of the $369 billion worth of tax breaks and subsidies set aside to boost green technology and energy security in the U.S., how can the EU maintain a leading position in clean tech industries moving forward? The problem is, is that they've taken six months to talk about this without doing anything. It's all been talked. And so companies have already been looking elsewhere outside of Europe. So unfortunately, I think what this is going to lead to is kind of a deindustrialization of not only Germany, but the Euro area as a whole. Mm. Wow, that's pretty dire. So so you say it's going to China, US, Mexico, and parts of South America. I assume that's Brazil, maybe. Yeah. Yes. So that's a net positive, I guess, for North America, at least. 
it is for North America. Europe is running very scared right now, right? They've been, again, they've been having meetings for the last six months, but the problem is, is that they continuously drag their feet on making decisions. And when you drag your feet that long, you give companies ample time to make other plans. Right. Okay. So how does this end? If if we had net gas stay at low levels for three years, do you think that manufacturing would, would come back? No. Back to Europe? No. I think they've already so made, done. once you've already made other plans and you already left, I mean, and we're talking about companies that have literally shut down things permanently. So parts and of Germany become Western Pennsylvania? Yes. Essentially, wow. if you want okay. to put in that, that, but again, I, you know, I'm not, I don't want to be a doom and gloomer and say it's totally the end of German manufacturing, but I will say that I would keep a close eye on that because I think that you're going to see, you know, I, I think Germany as an industrial powerhouse is going to not be over the next 10 years. Wow. That's when you. Tracy, when you say over the next 10 years, it's not going to be a powerhouse. Um, is that because the cost of producing, you're saying effectively, is so high that they're no longer going to be able to compete? Correct. Or is, is the flip side of that just that the cost will go up because the world needs their supply? Well, I, you know, I mean, it's... <clears throat> It's a, it, that's a two fold question. You know, first of all, we've already seen industry already close there permanently, such as BASF, which is the largest chemical manufacturing company in the world, basically, have, mm -hmm. has already decided to leave Germany, not entirely, but they decided, you know, they have decided to uh, pare down their manufacturing process and their labor in, in Germany and look elsewhere. Um, and I think that it's going to continue to happen because I think if you have to, if you look at Germany or EU in particular, there is a lot of bureaucratic red tape there and a lot of things. And until I think that uh, Europe really addresses that issue, more and more companies are going to be encouraged to go other places where perhaps that is not, you know, that red tape is not so difficult in addition, it's a lot cheaper as far as labor and et cetera. Wow. Okay. So how does how does Germany, how do does how does the German market, what can they do to cope with net gas prices? Just in terms of the day-to-day -day consumer. Well, as far as, I mean, obviously net gas prices have come way down since the peak in July of 2022. Um but I don't think that is, you know, I don't think that is completely over with. I think the market's a little uh, complacent right now uh, because prices have come down so much um, because the German government has been asking for people to cut their consumption, not only on the consumer side, but on the industry side as well. And so we've seen a 30% decrease in uh, consumer industry consumption due to a lot of initiatives that they've asked for and um while increasing their coal consumption so yeah and shutting nuclear yes <laughs> but wow. you know um so, so i think i you know i think it's a difficult road i don't think i don't think europe as a whole is out of the woods yet as far as nat gas is concerned uh, we talked about that last week a little bit um, but, you know, as far as industry is concerned, uh, I am really worried because I think the signs are all, all there that we are going, we are at least starting to see the deindustrialization process of Europe, which would be mark a significant change in industry, particularly for Germany. Wow. Okay. That's something to really think about, something we want to we want to keep an eye on because I'm very, very curious about that. Okay. Guys, thanks for a real downer of a show. That's awesome. <laughs> I said um, wages were going up. That's not all bad. Yeah. Yeah, no. No, this has been great. Look, I I, I it's we've been a little more thoughtful today. I think a little more kind of um kind of looking at kind of the whole context rather than just the markets. Um and I think that's great and I I think what's interesting to me is 
you know, there's not a lot of um, focus on this in the day-to-day -day hype cycle that we see, of course, right? Um, but these are things that we have to look at within the context, not necessarily within the decisions that we're making every day. And so, you know, I, I really appreciate this, Mike. I, I really appreciate it. between you and Sam, your newsletters have such deep thought in them and application to what's going on today, as well as say the medium or longer term. It's just fantastic um, to get that. So, so having said all that, guys, what's on your mind for the next week? So Tracy, let's start with you. The week ahead, what, what do you have coming up next week? What do we have coming up next week? I think next week, you know, I think honestly, it's going to be more of the same. I think we're going to see a lot of volatility in markets, especially, you know, looking at obviously commodity markets are kind of my focus. I think that you're going to see that. I think everybody should keep an eye on the dollar, particularly if you are trading commodities, because we are sort of seeing a technical breakout of some sorts, if, if looking at the daily charts. Um, so uh, keep an eye on the dollar. And then again, I, I still expect uh, volatility to continue in the commodity markets with conflicting news on, you know, a higher dollar, China reopening, and, you know, Russia uh, exports. Um, you know, they, they said they were cutting 500K uh, million barrels per day starting in March, but then they just said this morning that they're, but they're keeping exports the same markets, the crude oil market didn't really like that. Um, and so again, you know, stay yeah, their industrial production is down 20%. So of course they're going to cut $500,000 for domestic consumption. Are you still there, Tracy? Okay. Sam, um, how do you look for the, week? what are you looking for in the week ahead? Uh, in the week, uh, I'm, I'm basically just, Kind of listening to whatever. I, I don't really think there's that much that's all that interesting coming out next week. Maybe jobless claims will be interesting. Unlikely. Um, I don't know. And I mean, honestly, it's just a lot of chop. It's all about waiting. It's kind of like waiting on Godot, except you just sub in China for Godot. Wait for them to reopen. Wait for them to actually make a move on the stimulus you know, some announcements that actually make sense in terms of how they're going to stimulate, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so right now, I think it's a waiting game and sitting on your hands is probably the most intelligent thing to do through the job. Hmm. Yeah, China's going to announce rail stimulus like they have for the last 30 years. I can guarantee that's part of the mix. <laughs> so, okay, thanks for that. And Mike, uh, how about you? What What are you looking at for the week ahead? Well, I mean, we have the traditional data dynamics. Like Tracy, I'm very closely watching the U.S. dollar. Um, but more importantly, I'm starting to watch the credit events that are beginning to pile up. So you had Brookfield walk away from two buildings last week. You had Standine file for bankruptcy today. It's a fuel pump manufacturer. It's been in business continuously for 150 years, citing unsustainable levels of debt repayment from a, a you know buyout done with Cerberus. Um, you know, this is... This is the waiting, you know, the, the the higher for longer framework, the continued tightening of liquidity is the equivalent of a distributive top in, in equity terms, right? It just, you have to wait and it's going to happen. You're going to see the distress begin to mount. Um, and the Fed will ultimately manage to crush demand because they're creating an incredibly compelling reason for those at the high end with true discretion, right? I mean, remember the low end, that bottom 50 percentile that Sam, that Sam and I are highlighting in terms of the, the consumer, they don't really have a choice about discretionary spending. Mm. They basically don't really have any savings. And so when they're faced with a loss of real purchasing power, as we've seen over the last year, they originally, you know, kind of that second quartile turns to credit cards and other mechanisms to allow them to continue to purchase goods and services in the hopes that things are ultimately going to get better. We're now seeing those hopes begin to run out. The, you know, additional space on their credit cards is becoming exhausted. Unlike the old and uh, the extremely wealthy, they don't have significant quantities of cash in bank accounts or in money market funds, so they're not benefiting from the increasing purchasing power. You know, they're, they're beginning to falter. We'll see the signs of that. My expectation is sometime in the in the next quarter or so. Um, but it is a waiting game right now. Right. And until, you know, the, until the Fed begins to see the evidence that it's mission accomplished, in 
you know, hammering the demand side of the equation as compared to the supply side, which is really what they've hit so far. Um, my guess is, is that they're going to continue to proceed, right? The, the words we're getting are the equivalent of subprime is contained. Even as those of us who are following it closely fully understand that subprime is a critical part of the stack and was never really the problem to begin with. So what you're all saying is kind of take a deep breath for now. Take a deep breath and be prepared to hold it as we submerge. <laughs> my advice. Okay. It's good to know, guys. Thank you so much. This has been a real kind of wake up. So thanks very much. I really appreciate this. Um, have a great weekend and uh, have a great week ahead. Thank you. Thank Bye you. Guys.